When I was younger, a lot younger, in fact, I'd left drama school only about a year ago, I went to stay in a house in the countryside. Now, I went to drama school and I had a really lovely tutor. We got on really well together and we kept in contact after I left drama school. And I was really lucky because I landed a really nice role in a touring production immediately after drama school. And very sadly, it got completely panned by the critics. I got torn apart and I lost my confidence completely. I didn't want to act again. It was all I knew how to do. I got depressed and my lovely tutor rescued me. Now, she had inherited a house from her grandparents in the Norfolk countryside. And it was a very old house. Uh, it had been used as a farm for a long, long time, many generations. But it was just one wing of a much larger house, which had long gone. I would imagine at one time it was probably had a moat round it, but that had dried up. It was a bit sort of boggy in places, but there wasn't really anything to see. And at some point in its heyday, this house had decided it wanted to be on its own, or the occupants had decided that they wanted to be on their own. And the village was half a mile down the road. So next to this house, there was the church, which was on a sort of slight rise, um, a couple of hundred yards away. And it was surrounded by farmland, which was lumpy. And I think that must have been the original village under the fields. And yes, everybody had been packed off to live in a nice new village down the road. So the local squire, who I assume was living there then, didn't have to look at the locals. And this house, as I say, my tutor had inherited it. It had been empty since her grandparents had died. And she was hoping to divide it up into four flats. But before she did that, she suggested that I might like to go and live there for a bit to look after it for her and to just oversee the first bits of the renovation project until she could get down. Now, obviously, I didn't have an awful lot of experience in house renovation and I still don't, but she trusted me and actually she just wanted to give me some responsibility to make me feel better about myself and to have some quiet in the countryside to think about what I was going to do next with my life. So I packed my bags, I got on a train 
and then I got on a bus and then I got on another bus and I got off in this rather sweet Norfolk village, which I'm not going to tell you the name of because I don't think I want you poking about there. And I think other people don't want you poking about there. So the village had a nice Georgian looking pub with a very friendly landlord and it had a little post office and shop where you could buy the sort of bare essentials really and a few houses and, and that was about it. So I stuck my head into the pub because it was open and I had a very nice beer and I asked my way to the old hall, which was what the farm was called. They told me, so I picked up my rucksack and I walked out of the village, up an incline, round the corner, and at the top of the hill I could see the church and I could see the old hall, which is beautiful. Oh, I'm not really much of an architect, but I think uh, it might have been Tudor brick. It was the flat ones, the red flat ones, that beautiful Norfolk red colour, really nice. So I went up the drive, which as you might expect, it needed a bit of weaving because nobody had lived there for probably 20 years, I should think. They just had people popping in to keep an eye on the place. And I opened the door and it was amazing. It had a beautiful feeling to it. It was dusty. It did have heat and lighting. Well, it had electricity and lighting. Heating was by electric fires, plug in electric fires. There wasn't much else. And I spent a long time, I put my bag down and I went and had a good old poke round. I found the kitchen, which had an old arga. It also had an old microwave as well, um, which was just as well because I didn't really know what to do with an arga. It had a, a scullery or a boot room. It had a big room with books in it, which was absolutely great because I love books. Uh, it had what I think was probably a formal dining room with a big oak table in it. It had two flights of stairs, a big flight and then a little flight going up from the kitchen. Uh, I went up the little flight and there were the bedrooms. And the beds were all unmade, but I found the bedclothes stacked away in wardrobes and airing cupboards and chests of drawers. And I made myself up a bed. And it was starting to get a bit dark. So I popped a few lights on. Some of the bulbs were still working. Some of them were definitely not working, but luckily in the kitchen, I found some spares. So I went downstairs, I stuck some soup into the microwave and kind of forgot about it because then I thought actually I want to poke around and see what's outside as well. So the garden was overgrown but you could see that it had been lovely, you could see the rose beds. And there was an old walled garden as well. And, and again, you could see that once upon a time it had been beautiful, but the greenhouses against the walls, the glass had fallen in. And obviously there wasn't anything growing in the beds. You could hardly see where the beds had been. Um, though there were potatoes. I know about potatoes. They grow everywhere. Once you've got them, you've got them for life. And I could see um, that uh, in a few weeks time there would be potatoes. And as I didn't know how long I was going to be there, I thought, well, that'll be handy. 
and there were bats i love bats and all sorts of other things floating around the moths were coming out it was twilight and it was a really really beautiful june evening i was tired i'd come a long way I took my rucksack up, I had my soup, I took my rucksack up, went to bed. And I slept so well. And I dreamed so well. I, I can't remember the dreams, but people moved in and out of them. People I'd known a long time ago and people I didn't know. But would like to know. And the house was in the dream as well. The rooms that I hadn't looked at yet. In my dream there was a cellar and an attic and I knew there was a flight of stairs up to the attic because I'd seen them earlier but I hadn't quite liked to go up. I hadn't seen the st stairs to the cellar yet but I didn't know was it my dream? I don't know. So I woke up early because the curtains were very threadbare and I hadn't drawn them anyway. So I woke up with the sunshine and went downstairs, nibbled a bit of breakfast and bits of my dream came back to me. And I looked for the cellar, but I couldn't find it. So I assume that's just my dream, but I made a mental note that I was going to go up and have a look at the attic later. Obviously there was a lot of cleaning to do, which, you know, was part of the deal, despite the fact that the builders were going to be in. I was supposed to be taking down the moth-eaten curtains, going through the bedding, seeing what was good and what wasn't good and so on. And I thought I'd start by looking up in the attic. So up I went into the attic. And as you might expect, in an old house that had been inhabited for more years than I can imagine, the attic was just heaving with stuff. There were dresses from all sorts of eras, and some of them were falling apart, and some of them I picked up and held against myself, and they looked good enough to wear. Um, and there were boxes, shoe boxes and trunks. And there was an old chest of drawers. So I thought that's nearest to the attic door. So I'm going to start in there. So I opened the first drawer and it was obviously full of somebody's collection. There was all sorts of stuff, all packaged up. There were fossils and bits of bone. There were stones. There were bird's eggs, I'm afraid. There was quite an extensive collection of bird's eggs. Um, and they were all labelled. Um, I opened one drawer and there were cases of butterflies with uh, pins stuck through them. And I found that slightly disturbing. So I shut that drawer and I put it away. And then I found snake skins and owl pellets. And I'm not too good on this sort of thing, really. I'm, I wouldn't say I have a nervous disposition, but I, <sighs> these things perturbed me. I think that's the only word for it. And in another drawer, I found pretty things. I found beads and stones and crystals. And that, that was like a playtime for me. I, I just had that drawer out. I had them all out on the dusty attic floor and I thought, I'm going to have some of these to decorate my room. 
So I gathered up the ones that I liked the best and slipped them into my pockets and as many as I could in my hands and I went downstairs to the bedroom that I'd chosen and I laid them out all over the chests of drawers and the window seat and I just looked at them and I thought I don't know who collected these I don't know how long they've been in that drawer for I mean the birds eggs I mean people haven't collected birds eggs for what 50 years I don't know so I knew they'd been there certainly the birds eggs for a long time and as I said some of the things have been labeled and the labels were um, faded and the writing on the labels was that kind of faded brown ink that you see in not very good museums which are sometimes the best museums incidentally so I'd arranged everything in my room and I went about my business. I did a bit of tidying. I checked the sheets. I made a pile of ones that were for dumping. I made a pile of ones um, that were usable. I found some patchwork quilts, which were absolutely gorgeous. And I thought, well, they could be worth some money. So I folded those up. Basically, I did the job I'd been asked to do. And as the night fell, I went and had another look in the garden. And again, the bats were coming. I don't know what sort they were. They were probably from the attic, um, which I guess was probably going to give my tutor a bit of problems when it came to converting the place into flats. Um, but yes, I, I wandered around and I listened to the birds coming into roost at night. I started hearing an owl in the distance it was just the best place for me to be at that time. And again, I had some supper in the microwave and off I went to bed. And I started dreaming again. And this time I didn't dream about people. I started dreaming about the stones that had lain around my room. And in my dream, I went to the stones and I picked them up one at a time. But they didn't look exactly the same as the stones and crystals that I'd brought down from the attic. They were bigger. They, I could feel a weight to them. That's quite unusual in dreams, isn't it? To feel the actual physical weight of something they seemed bigger and there seemed more of them and I felt that they wanted me to do something but I didn't know what and I picked up a really heavy beautiful multifaceted purple crystal. Now I didn't remember bringing this down from the attic but it was the best one and I knew I wanted it to be there when I woke up. It was completely natural it didn't have like felt on the base or anything there wasn't a label saying a pleasant present from Glastonbury or anything like that it was just beautiful so in my dream I put it back down on the biggest window seat this bedroom I was in it had windows on two sides of the room and one had a large window seat with dusty cushions in, one was smaller, but I put it in the large window seat. So I woke up the next morning and I remembered my dream. And I looked around my room and there were, I'm sure there were, 
more stones and more crystals. And I remembered the purple crystal from my dream. And I went to the windowsill expecting it to be there and it wasn't there. And I was kind of quite relieved about that. But I wasn't really sure how many stones and crystals I brought down out of the attic. So I decided that I was just misremembering and yeah, there were probably just a few more than I expected. So I had another day of tidying and sorting and I was really growing to love the house. It's the sort of place I've always wanted. And I was really sad that I was going to, going to be there for a few weeks, a few months, because it felt right to me. And as I picked everything up, I just liked thinking about the people who had used the objects and who else had folded the bed linen and whether I was folding it as well as they did. Probably not because actually folding things isn't really what I'm terribly good at. I'm an actor. Um, so I got through the day and went back to sleep. And that night, I had a similar dream. I dreamt about the stones that were around my room. And again, the crystal was there, but it wasn't in the window seat where I'd left it. I dreamt I woke up and it was on the pillow beside me. So I dreamt I turned my head and I could see the light shining off the purple crystal. And I picked it up and it was really cold, colder than just through the night sky. It almost was freezing my fingers. And I, again, I, I picked it up and I, I put it back in the window seat and I was touching the other stones and crystals. And again, I, I felt that they wanted me to do something. And I didn't know what. And I went back to sleep and I had another dream. And I had the dream about the people again, people I couldn't see, people I didn't know. And I woke up out of that dream and I was really quite unsettled by it. It was the first, what you might call nightmare that I'd had. And I don't know why it was a nightmare. I just knew that I was scared enough in my dream to wake up out of it. And it was just before dawn and I could start hearing the dawn chorus coming. And I stuck my head out of one of the windows and I looked at the church on the hill and I could hear the birds coming from the beech trees that were around the house and the church. And I looked over at the other windowsill and again, there wasn't a crystal there. And I decided I was going to go for a walk before breakfast. So I took myself out and this time I went out of the gardens and I thought I'll go and walk up to the church because it, it looked as if it was still in use and there was quite a good path going from the hall up to the church. So off I went up this path. But when I got to the churchyard, there was no notice of services <coughs> or anything like that. Um, the churchyard hadn't been mown so I didn't know if it's one of those ones that had like been left for wildlife um, so that it was deliberately overgrown or just because it, nobody had been there. But the church was open. It had one of those great big heavy doors with a big ring bolt to open the, open the door with. So I opened it and pushed it open. And actually inside the church seemed quite well tended. There were only a couple of pews in there. 
but it was very pretty. And there were, um, there was a dead flower arrangement by the altar as if somebody had had a wedding there um, and the flowers hadn't been cleared away. And there was almost a slight sense there was, well, first of all, there was that damp smell that old country churches get, no matter how well looked after they are. But there was also just a little whiff of incense in the air as well. And it felt like the hall. It felt like a nice place to be. I was happy in there. And I sat down on one of these uh, pews, which was one of the really old ones with the poppy heads carved it was carved in some kind of animal uh, but I couldn't really tell what it was it might have been a bird but I, who knows something a bit fanciful I think so I, I sat there and I looked at the light coming through the glass and there was a bit of stained glass it was mostly plain a little bit of stained glass so there were coloured patterns coming down in front of the pews in front of the uh, the pulpit, which again had beautiful carvings on, this beautiful wooden pulpit with carvings on it. And the light that shone through the stained glass window, it, it wasn't medieval glass. It was obviously a memorial window to people who had lived in the village in the past. Um, there wasn't any writing on it, but that bit was blank at the bottom where you might expect it to say in loving memory of or sacred to the memory of or whatever. Um, but I could see that there was a woman and a man in the, the glass and the woman was wearing the most beautiful purple dress. I would think you'd call it um arts and crafts style um so a long drapey dress that looked as if it was medieval but it wasn't um so she was in the front and behind her um there was a man who was wearing uh, a suit but you couldn't see him so well and she had a little white dog with her as well a little grey handy type thing uh, maybe a whippet, something like that. I'm not good at dogs. And the light, as I say, was just pouring through the purple of her dress, making this big purple puddle on the floor of the church. And it was lovely, but I had work to do and I didn't want to let my tutor down because she had been so kind to me. So I went back, did some more work. I polished the oak table because it just felt so dry. And in the kitchen cupboard, I found this polish of beeswax and I love the smell of beeswax. So I found some rags and I rubbed away at this table for mm, probably a good hour and a half, I should think. My arms really ached by the time I'd finished it. When I had, it had that lovely glow and feel to it that fat, well-fed wood has. And I snuffed it and I could smell the beeswax and I always felt I could hear the bees coming in from the garden as if the garden was full of beehives. So I did a good day's work, back to bed and for the third night I dreamt about the stones. And I'm sure that there were more stones, more crystals. It felt as there were stones and crystals on every single surface. But I couldn't see the purple crystal. It wasn't there. And then I realized that I could hear the humming that I had heard when I waxed the table. The sound of bees in my dream. And I realized that my dream had taken me into the daylight. 
and I looked out of the window and I could see that the garden was full of roses and Michaelmas daisies and hollyhocks and all sorts of beautiful flowers. And the bees were everywhere. So all I could hear was the hum of the bees. And I liked that noise. And I listened for it a while and then my dream must have faded because I had another dream. And this time I dreamt about the lady in the purple dress and her little white dog and the man behind her shoulder who I couldn't see so well. She didn't say anything to me, but she was standing by the big table in the hall and the dog was playing around her feet and the man I was just conscious of him I couldn't really see him but I knew he was there moving around and she was looking at me and she wasn't angry but her eyes were just fixed on me and her little dog started whimpering and hiding behind her and I could feel her gaze going right through me and I was just stuck to the spot and the next thing I knew I was awake but I wasn't in my bed and I wasn't downstairs by the table. I, I was standing in the window seat, looking out the window into the garden. And again, it was dawn and I could hear the dawn chorus and I felt I needed to get out of the house. So, I decided that I would do a bit of work in the garden and I like gardening. I don't always know what I'm doing, but I just wanted to make the garden a, a bit tidier again. And I really did feel quite jangled. So I went into the walled garden and there was a potting shed in one corner, which luckily was unlocked. And it was just full of gardening treasures, just all these beautiful vintage gardening tools. Um, some I just didn't know what they were at all. But uh, one thing I found was a lawnmower, luckily. And I found shears and I found a spade and I found a fork and, you know, everything you could really need. And I decided that I was going to start on a particular flower bed and in this flower bed I could see old roses growing so I decided I was going to see if I could rescue them I could see that some of them were in bud but the wood was grey and gnarled and some of them were definitely not going to bloom again so I took the fork and the spade and the shears and I sort of cut a path towards the bed and I trimmed along the side so I could kind of see where the bed was meant to start and I started hauling the grass out of the bed around the roses and that kept me happy for quite some time and I could see one or two of the roses were actually in bud and they had just the faintest little whiff of proper rose perfume coming off them. I love rose perfume. Now I was getting to the point where I needed to work a bit more carefully around the roots of the roses. So I found a, a trowel and a hand fork and I started digging more carefully. And one of the roses was climbing up an old trellis on the wall behind, behind them. And 
Oh, hang on. Sorry, I've just lost Harriet. She's coming back. Um, yes, yeah, so one of the roses was growing up the wall behind them and it was overhanging everything. So I kind of pushed it up and tied it up. I had a little bit of string, so I tied it back and I started working the ground underneath the rose bush. And I found a little skull, a little white skull of a little dog. A little dog with a pointed muzzle. And I felt a bit scared at that point because I remember the dog from my dream, the little white dog, the little whippity type dog. And I carefully moved the soil aside and it was all there and it has been wrapped up in uh, like a shawl or something and it had a little collar round its neck and the collar had a dog's name on it. Well, I assume it was the dog's name. The collar said Miriam. I thought that was really sweet. So I dug the hole a bit deeper and I wrapped the bones up again and I put it back and covered it up. And I thought I need to make sure that that dog isn't disturbed again. So I went back up to my bedroom and I got one of the large stones and there were definitely more stones there than I had ever brought down from that chest of drawers. But I got the largest stone, which when I looked at it, had a sun carved into it. And I thought, that will make a nice gravestone for the little dog, for the little dog Miriam. So I took it down and I placed it on top of the dog's grave. And that night I went to bed again and I, I really didn't want to dream. So I had a cup of chamomile tea, which I'd found mouldering at the back of a cupboard. God knows how, how old it was. And I took a bit of a sleeping tablet because when I was depressed, I had trouble sleeping and I'd still got some sleeping tablets. So I had half a sleeping tablet. And I did dream, despite taking the precautions, but this was a really hazy dream, but I saw the woman in the purple dress again, and she didn't have the dog with her. And she was pacing around, I couldn't really see her, but she was pacing around and her purple dress was swirling and I saw her going up and down the stairs and pacing around the hall looking worried and concerned and again I was conscious of the man and I was conscious of being a bit scared of the man and I couldn't see where he was. I kept thinking he was behind me and I kept looking behind me and I knew he was there but I, I couldn't see him and she suddenly stopped and she turned around and she looked at me again and this time she looked at me and I could see that she was scared and I realised she wasn't looking at me. I don't think she could even see me. She was looking through me. And I knew that the man was standing behind me and I knew that he was the person that she was scared of. And I woke up. And again, there wasn't 
any crystal in the room. There was no purple crystal in the room. And again, the sun was coming up. So I went out of that house quickly and I found myself going up to the church again. And again, the sun was coming up and it was coming faintly through the window. And I saw the purple stain on the floor of the church where the light was coming through the purple of the dress. And I looked up at the window and I realized I couldn't see the little dog anymore. And I also realized that I could see more of the man behind the woman's shoulder. I could start to make his face out. And I was really very scared. But I had work to do and I couldn't let my tutor down. And I thought, I'm gonna go back up to the attic because I've sorted the bed linen. There's a lot to do in the attic. I won't open the chest of drawers again. I am gonna have a good look in that attic. And I went up the little stairs into the attic and I deliberately didn't look at the chest of drawers. I thought, where am I going to go? So the attic had a skylight. So luckily there was, we didn't call it a skylight in the days when the attic was made. It was a little, a little window anyway. It was letting the light in. And there was an interesting looking trunk I could just see the edge of. And it had some old curtains, I think, on top of it. So I went to the trunk and I picked the curtains off the lid of the trunk. And underneath the curtains, there was a large purple crystal. But it didn't pick up the light because the purple crystal was stained with something brown, a light film of something brown. And when I touched it, it was cold. It was very cold, colder than you would expect from being in the attic. And when I lifted the crystal, the lid of the trunk moved. It didn't fit terribly well, and I, maybe I just caught it with my knee, but it felt as if it moved. And I put the crystal down because it was heavy. And I lifted the lid of the trunk. And I realized that the reason why the trunk lid didn't sit closed properly was because there was a fold of a purple gown caught in it. And I lifted the lid of the trunk And I saw the yellow hair and the purple dress. And I looked into the empty eye sockets of the lady from my dreams. And I saw where her skull had been bashed in by something large and heavy.
and I heard somebody moving at the far end of the attic and I looked up and I saw a man's face staring at me. I left that night. I didn't even wait for night. I ran out of that attic. I left my bag. I went to the church and I, I almost didn't want to look. But I looked up at the window. And it wasn't purple anymore. There was just a man standing there, looking out at the empty church. And I don't want to tell you where the village is, because I don't think that they would really want you to know the story.